Hey everybody, it's Josh Dorkin here with BiggerPockets.com. I've got for you yet another special interview, but this special interview is really special because we've got the man, the baldy himself, bald guy, Jeff Brown. What's up, Jeff? Just the normal stuff in San Diego, paradise. Uh, yeah, well, Jeff can be found on Bigger Pockets at BiggerPockets.com slash users slash bald guy, B-A-W-L-D-G-U-I. And his website is baldguy.com. And if you want to find him anywhere else on the web, pretty much look up bald guy and, and you got him. And obviously, as you can see, he's got a head of hair that is unlike any other. What's up? So what's going on, man? How's San Diego? How's real estate treating you? Uh, we're loving it, man. I started the day with a light breakfast, a little little reading, and a walk in the park. Yeah, that's a typical hard working day for uh, for a magnate like yourself. Oh yeah, 80 degrees, uh, breeze from the ocean about three miles an hour, and and uh, very nice mobile scenery. Nice, nice, nice. All right, man. Well, let's cut to the chase. We're all here for one reason. That's to talk about real estate. Uh, Jeff has been writing for Bigger Pockets for a while now, and for his own sites for much longer. As you can tell, no offense, Jeff, but you're no spring chicken. So I think you've been <laughs> around the block a little bit longer than most of us, huh? Uh, just a bit. Got my license uh, about almost exactly 60 days after I turned 18. And that was? Uh, it'll be uh, 42 years from that day in the middle of this August. So you, you, you've you been at this for a while? Uh, just a bit. I'm second generation. Fantastic. So so who was it? Was it your dad, your mom? My dad. Okay, cool. And what, what, was, uh, what did your dad do? My dad was a, uh, t a traditional house broker in okay. San Diego. Okay. As a matter of fact, from took him a year to get going, started the spring of 64. From 65, um, 6, 7, 8, and 9, he closed never less than 1,000 sides uh, as a company and never had as many as 40 people working for him. Huh. So you've been pretty much in real estate. Yeah, I, I'm not even going to go there. I'm starting to calculate things in my head, presidents and, well, 40, you know, I, Lots, lots of things have happened over the generations. You bring a perspective unlike that uh, of, of many others who, who are out and about these days. Um, and, and that's really why I wanted to talk to you. you. You know, you've been there. You've seen it all. I've seen, I've seen a lot. I've yeah. seen a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's, let's kind of let's, let's get, get into it. Let's kind of kick back to the early days, you know. What was what was real estate? What was the scene like back when you started? And I'm assuming it was down in San Diego that you started, yeah? Absolutely. Okay, I've so worked here since '67. All right, give us give us a picture. Well, my first year was Nixon's first year in office to go by presidents. It was '69. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, the market back then, um, a, a three bedroom, two bath in a in a in a decent area was anywhere from. Fourteen to nineteen thousand, even in San Diego. My God! Yeah. Um, but I think that the thing that people should know is that the interest rates were eight, nine percent, and that was FHA, VA, yeah. normal twenty percent down, everything, and houses sold. Yep. Um, uh, it it changed as time went on, but but literally, most people, even them, been in the business even twenty years, don't understand that. I was in the business for 32 years before I saw an interest rate that started with a number less than seven. Yeah, yeah. What was what was the highest rate you ever saw? I, I know it was. I mean, it I, was I don't 16 know. and a half or 17 was FHA okay. in 1980, 81. Yeah, I feel like I remember hearing it was approaching 20 plus percent. Well, that was when the prime was 20, 21, and and inflation was was in the low mid teens. That's just that's that's incredible. I mean, how how were people doing it back then? What you know, what what was it like for you know the average Joe who wanted to buy a house? Um, they were mostly becoming checkers at Alpha Beta. Um, seriously, uh, people talk about this being the, the worst downturn of all time. Yeah. And in many ways, I I understand their feelings. So so but, really quick because you totally drop one over me. Checker at Alpha Beta is is it's a grocery store. Okay. Sales checker. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm going old school on here. Hey, I wanted to make sure it wasn't a real estate thing that just like slid past me. I'm like, wait a second. I should probably know these things. But no. well, you're just such a whippersnapper. You don't have any idea. 
<laughs> All right, so they're checkers at the Alpha Beta. You know, your average mom and pop guy. Uh, what? So, so how 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 is a checker at a grocery store? You know, putting down money on a on on a twenty percent uh, mortgage. Well, but back then, now I lived in San Diego. Now San Diego is a monster Navy town. Always has been. Yeah. And so uh, I I worked in, in the seven years I worked uh, in the housing market from fall of 69 until uh, 76 when I started to make the transition to investments. Yeah. Um, I did one convention alone, and I had to be babysat through it. Gotcha. It was all FHA, BA. Um, our, you can't swing a dead cat in San Diego without hitting two chiefs. Uh, so I didn't know about the conventional market that much. That's what people bought really high-priced houses, yeah. like, you know, 30000 Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so so the market has obviously fluctuated. You know, the, the we've seen just ridiculous bubbles over the years. You get in, you know, you, you've seen it, you've experienced it. You transition from from one side of the business into the to the investment side. Um, you, you know what what caused you to transition? Um, why did why did you go from from that sales side to to really focusing on the investment side primarily? Um, I'll make it real short here. Yeah. Uh, um, if one more woman told me the color in the living room was wrong and that's why they couldn't make an offer in the house, I was going to be on the eleven o'clock news. Uh -huh. And I was going to get the husband too for allowing it. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm not politically correct, but I just didn't have, I, I don't have that in me. I got you. I, I got you. I just, yeah, I love the picture the, of the pink as green. Picture it as green. Picture yeah. it as blue. Picture it as yeah, something yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and not to mention that back then for fifty bucks, you could have bought uh, enough cases of beer and enough pizza over a weekend to have three couples help you paint the. Paint it inside and out twice. <laughs> so it, it, I, I couldn't hack it. So I, I got you. And I'm just far more suited to investments. Right, right. Okay, so so you moved to investments. Let's get into it. Right. What what did that look like? What did you start doing? Um, what was your what was your investing career? Right. How'd you how'd you get started? And, and what'd you focus on? I had a tremendous title rep uh, named Ron Pennick, and he introduced me to the inner sanctum of San Diego County, which was located up in North County, San Diego, 45-minute one-way drive for me in the mornings right. once a month. Of a, It was an exchange club, tax-deferred exchange club. Okay. And this was, this was in, in the heat of the mid-late 70s uh, rise. Okay. And I sat there the first meeting, and Josh, literally, they would talk for a minute each, and I would understand um, conjunctions and, and other words, and don't and can't, but everything else, I thought they were just making fun of me. <laughs> and, and, and he took me there for that reason, because yeah. I thought I really knew what I was doing, and, right. and, and I had no clue. Well, you know, the same applies today, not for you, of course, but, you know, I'd say most real estate agents know very little about investing. Um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, that's right. certainly the case, you know, from then to now, right? Right. And, but, but from then, um, they, they all, uh, uh took a liking to me because a, I wasn't like my dad who, who almost all of them knew that was a plus. Right. Right. And, and, uh, uh so they all told me where to, where to go to get educated. Oh, and it was, a, it was like, uh, being given the key to the vault. Yeah. Which I, I took advantage of completely. Gotcha, gotcha. So you know, you went, you learned, you you start to educate yourself. Um, you know, what did, did you go the buy and hold route? Did you you know were you rehabbing properties? What you know what were you what were you doing? Well, by the time I had gone through uh, the seminars with maybe four or five iconic brokers yeah. in, in California, and then finished CCIM, which I did in 1980, which was the transition to Hell year, mm -hmm. um, uh, we were we were officially in in real estate vacuum. Yeah, and I didn't realize CCIM is, is actually goes goes back that that far. That's yeah, impressive. yeah. It's good I don't to know. About those, both goes back, but I took my first course in January or February of nineteen eighty. Yeah, and and just so people um, oh, know, it, it's it's commercial um, 
certification, right? It's a commercial certification, and and it's taught by people that are are not teaching because they can't do it. They were still doing it and right. doing it very well yeah. all across the country. The fail rate for the first course, there's yeah. five courses, it's 200 hours, yeah. is is 50%. Yeah, and, and I'd say, you know, I've never taken CCIM, but those folks that I, that I do know who have, I don't think there's any who don't know what they're talking about. I, I'd say, you know... Yeah, the the whole guru and all the the educational crap that's out there. CCIM is it's the real deal. It's legit. If you're looking for for an education in real estate, CCIM is 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 probably the place you want to start. Oh, my my son has uh, his uh, his degree from Cal State Fullerton in international business, and and the stuff I taught him from CCIM, and said he said his business classes taught it, but not that much in depth. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. So, so you went through through all this stuff, and, then and I, I I then came back at at, uh, at basically um, um, twenty seven, twenty eight years old, yeah, uh, twenty nine actually, and um, was ready to conquer the world because, of course, at that point, I really did know everything there was to know, and uh, what you find out very quickly is that uh, basically what you've been given is the chance to start. Um, uh, some somewhere higher than an ignoramus, which I was before. Right, right. And right. and it was a great, great learning. I'll never give it. Uh, Want to give that back because the years from from the end of 1980 until the end of 1983 were just like going through fire. Mm. Be tested. Oh sure. And those that that survived that period of time, Joshua. Um, we we just cannot be intimidated. Yeah. Now the times that we're in now, not yeah. even close to back then. Sure. Sure. We got you. Got you. Yeah. Well, you know, there's 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 always those industries and there's always those periods in, in different industries. And if if you can if you could survive, then then you're you're going somewhere, right? It's it's the trial, exactly. the, the test trials, and so yeah. No, that's great. Um, what what did that look like? What did, you know? What were you doing then? We were we were making stuff up as we went. Every I was a member of several exchange clubs, and back then only only the knowledgeable, experienced, and the tough were there. Uh -huh. Everybody else was was pretty much gone. Uh -huh. And we would sit there, and very rarely did we not do business in a month. Uh, we would we would have seller carrybacks. We would then hypothecate the seller carryback to uh, by getting a loan from the local bank. Uh -huh. So that they could pay their fees and move on to something that actually made sense. People were people were moving sideways like crazy to get out of what we called alligators, which was huge properties with huge negative cash flows. Gotcha. They, the business was eighty percent having both the broker and the clients come out alive when the recovery came. Gotcha. So where where were you? You know, what was your role? What you know, what what was your I mean, obviously, over the years, I'm sure you you kind of you know transition from one thing to the next. But what was you know today? You're out. You're helping folks invest. What were you doing back then? Well, when we finally emerged, and I knew we were emerging because I had a client of mine uh, who praised me to the high heavens to anybody who would listen because I got him a loan on seven units he had uh, acquired that was an adjustable rate that started below twelve. Mm -hmm. He thought I walked on water. Uh -huh. um, but from then on until the SNL crisis, um, we were actually in more or less normal and boom times. And I told people, buy, make sure it pays for itself minimum, yeah. and, and hold. The difference is, you know, that's, that's almost a lie in San Diego. Because from 85 up to, say, the middle of 1990, Joshua, hold meant anywhere from 10 to 18 months. Gotcha. Um, it wasn't that we were trying to flip. It's just that a, a, a perfect example is I had somebody that started with me with 70 grand. Yeah. Um, they called me up on an ad and said, we want to buy a duplex. Can you help us? We think you're pretty good. Yeah. I said, well, why just a duplex? And they ended up buying a two-unit and a three-unit. They closed escrow total, 68.5 out the door. Uh -huh. On the way out, they're... They were one of those young couples you had to really protect from themselves. Right. So go go, 
when are we going to sell this? I said, hey, just relax. Probably three to five years with my crystal ball is as cracked as yours. Thirteen months later, we closed the sale on both of those. Uh -huh. And the net check from escrow, remember, they put in 68.5. Yeah. The net check from escrow to them was over 220 grand. That's pretty nice. And they ended up with a, they added 50,000 that they had saved. They were real savers. They were both college educated, fairly right. large earners. And they ended up buying five properties in that tax deferred exchange. So you were, because no, no, I, you know, I, and I don't mean to keep harping on it, your, your specific role was as an exchanger at this point? Or, or what was your, I mean, what was your exact, what were you doing exactly, you specifically? I guess the I guess the elevator pitch would be my my job was to create uh, growth and net worth, create wealth, by but keeping people away as far away from the edge of the cliff as possible. So you were uh, acting as an advisor then, as you are today. Absolutely, because I was trained by the icons I mentioned yeah. earlier that that's what our job was. We were not order takers, and they absolutely had were disgusted with that part of the business that said, what do you want, Josh? I want to buy a duplex. Okay, we have four over here. So you, instead of, you know, you're, you're an agent, you're a broker, but it, as opposed to being a stockbroker, you were the money manager, right? So you were, you were the guy who, instead of just, hey, we want you to churn and turn, we want to churn and burn, churn and turn, whatever, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. We, we, want, we want to coddle you. We want to walk you through the process. We're going to hold your right. hand and we're going to watch you and protect you over the years as you grow your portfolio. Focus primarily, specifically on real estate. Oh, yeah, and, and not only that, but I would, I would actually back people off of what they wanted to do, yeah. which they'd never experienced before. Oh. Um, I would refuse to take clients if they didn't have enough cash reserves. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what most people find uh, surprising is, I did too as I went along, but my CCIM instructors told me this would be my experience, and they were right on the money. Yeah. About one out of three to 40%, I would tell, don't do anything, you're doing great. Mm, yeah. Hey, man, well, when I was an agent in L.A., probably around 10 years ago, scary, um, for an old young whippersnapper like myself, uh, I, you know, I mean, that was early bubble, and I remember, you know, everybody was just jumping, jumping at, you know, I got to buy something, I got to buy something, and I'm saying, whoa, slow down, you, you know, you, you're going to get in this property, you can afford a loan because there's creative loans out there. But you right. can't afford the loan. And what are you doing? You, you shouldn't be jumping into this. I can't help you jump into this. Talk to somebody else. Deal with somebody else because you can't afford it. And they said, well, the property is going to go up, blah, blah, blah. You know. And they were right. And they probably turned them, bought it, turned it, made some money. But they probably got in again and got burned when, when, every, when, the, when the crap hit the fan. And, and so, yep. you, you know, it's, you can't protect people from themselves. You can only do so much, you know? Absolutely. And, and I came to that conclusion, uh, as I've discussed with you before, yeah. uh, in, at the end of 2003, that I couldn't in good conscience sell people San Diego income property anymore. Yeah, yeah, um, Ab absolutely. And, and looking back with 2020 hindsight, I was a year late. Yeah, I was, I was wrong too. We're all wrong. Nobody, you know, nobody was right. We don't want to get into this. It's a political discussion. You and I will have a lot of fun yeah. personally talking about it, but I don't think people want to hear it. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so you, you know, you, you got a lot of experience, a lot of history in in seeing markets. Um, let's talk about today. <laughs> Jump cut. <laughs> all right. There you go. So we're halfway through 2011, and we are. <laughs> You got it. Keep going. You're cracking me up. So, so we're halfway. So we're halfway through 2011, and you know, let, let, let's talk about what, what what are you what are you what are you doing, folks? You know, where where are you focusing people? You're in San Diego. Are you telling them to buy in San Diego? Are you looking out of state? You know, what's what's kind of your your core philosophy, obviously, it's gonna it's gonna um, depend on who you are. You know, if if I come in with you know a hundred grand and I'm making Boku bucks every year, you're gonna tell me something else. If then if I'm a guy who's you know I'm working a teacher's salary and I've just saved up enough to kind of kick kick myself and be dangerous. Um, but let's let's maybe talk about that guy because I think 
um, the, the guys with, with the higher net worth and, and a little more wealth probably have a better shot at having some higher level folks advising them at this point. So, you know, t take the average beginner investor who's, you know, making, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 a year. Um, you know, they've s saved up some cash. What, you know, what does is, what is your relationship look like with them? How do you kick, them, kick, uh, kick their careers off? What I what I do is I I tell them look at whether you're from San Diego or, or East Toilet Seat Alabama, you know and there are East Toilet Seats in other states too. We're not just picking on Alabama guys. That's right. I, I matter of fact, I usually say Iowa. But what what I tell them is, you, you've got to go where the return makes sense, where the macroeconomics, which most people gloss over, make sense. Yeah. And 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 today there's more than one. But but when you really look at the hierarchy right now, there's Texas and there's no number two. Um, you 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 have people for the first time. Texas is a is a destination state. Yeah, it has all the good things going for it. They're incredibly pro business. They're yeah. the anti California. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and uh, uh, so that's where I'm telling them to go. They're putting they're putting twenty percent down. They're buying properties for give or take a. a a quarter million dollars mm -hmm. that are giving them somewhere between a five and a nine percent cash on cash return from day one. Wow. Um, uh, they're they're writing off uh, uh, all the cash flow uh, from day one, and I'm just telling them, okay, then just go and live your life. Yeah. And but I'm also then putting them in a second basket that doesn't do me any good, but it's just the right thing to tell them. Right. And that is a non real estate investment. Which I've written about on Bigger Pockets, EIUL. It's a it's an investment grade insurance policy, for lack of a better description. Sure. And and, and as a matter of fact, I just had one of my newer clients who finally ended up finally he closed his first couple of he's going to be buying about four or five properties from me. Yeah. He's he's not quite a ranked beginner, but he's the next level. Yeah. And very way smart. Yeah. And he finally talked to my guy, and he called me, and he goes, "Holy crap, Jeff." You didn't communicate to me exactly how good they were. And I said, oh, I beg to differ. <laughs> I said, I had to pound you for a month and a half to call him. Yeah. He says, well, you were right. Well, why don't we save that for another topic because I, another interview. I think, I think we could definitely get into the EIUL discussion now, but I think uh, we'll save it for another day um, but big, big, because that's an entire topic in its own. Absolutely. Right. Um, sure. So you're 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 talking Texas, tax friendly. Lots lots of good things going for the state. Now, are you having them self manage out of state in Texas, or are you having uh, you know them work through some kind of turnkey product, or are you actually? Oh uh, no no. What I do and I, what I've always done since I left San Diego eight years ago was I go there myself. I'm old school to the core. And old school says if you don't put your own boots on the ground, you're you're playing games. Oh yeah. And so uh, Southwest people know me by face. Yeah. Uh, and I and I go there and I look at every single property before it's, I look at the dirt. I look at everything. I I I vet and I find and vet and hire management firms that that return my calls. Yeah. That, that when people say, hey, we're Jeff Brown, we're the ball guy's client. Um, they, everybody's up front. Right. Uh, I have the same thing with title, escrow. We have everything set up, and those people answer to me. Yeah. And okay. I have a very good relationship. So essentially, I call you. I say, "Hey, Jeff. I hear you know. I hear you've uh, you've got this good thing going. You can help me kind of kick things off." Um, you basically hold my hand. You walk me through. You handle soup to nuts is what it kind of sounds like, or, or am I missing something? 80% of my clients never leave their living room, Joshua. Yeah. Uh, we, we get them the financing, the management, mm -hmm. uh, make sure the escrow goes right, make sure all the paperwork's right, get them credits sure. for closing costs, sure. um, everything. Now, the, and the 20% that want to see it, we make it easier for them to get there. Yeah. We arrange for my team to give them personal tours of exactly what I'm recommending. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, 
And obviously, you know, you take your fees and, 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 and whatnot and make your... The sellers pay me just like any Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. Okay. Interesting. Now, now you you focus long term. You're you're not necessarily you you write a lot about you know retirement, um, right? Because that's that's what you're shooting for. But take a guy like me. I'm 35, not 34, not 2010. It's 2011. Yeah. I'm right. 35, and uh, you know you're gonna you're gonna give me a different advice than you would give uh, a guy who's 50 years old, obviously, just like the stockbrokers would tell somebody to be a little more aggressive now. Absolutely. Um, what would you consider to be a more aggressive way to go? Take a guy who's 35. Let's, let, you know what, let's look at, I'm 35, I'm 45, and I'm 55. Let's take the 35-year-old. What, what's, what's your tactic? What's your strategy for the 35-year-old? For the well, let's 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 knock down assumption dominoes real quickly. Sure, absolutely. They have they have an adequate um, uh, cash reserve, which I call Sominix account. People your age would call Ambien account. <laughs> and, and I and I lie to them and tell them it's so they'll sleep when when in reality it's so I can sleep. Sure. Um, once they have that and they they have a great FICO score, they uh, uh, they they have enough cash to close whatever it is. I find out that that I, I find out from them. Look, you're 35. Now, I don't want to assume that you've got 30 years because you may want to retire by 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Sounds like a good idea to me. Right. And, or, or maybe you're looking at a 15- or 20-year window. Sure. Okay, so let's say it's a 20-year window. I say, look at what do you have? Well, let's say that between by hook or by crook and 401Ks or whatever you have, you're, you, you've got maybe a quarter million dollars over and above your cash reserves. Sure. Now, that's not, that's not abnormal. Uh, it's not rare, but it's not super common. Right, right. But, but what, I, what I would do is I would put you in maybe, um, oh, give or take, a million dollars worth of property uh, it, it, as fast as I could. Mm -hmm. um, we, would, we would close everything up. We would then, we would then say, look, we would address your, your 401K, and I would show you step by step how, how that's killing you long term. Yeah. And most of my clients see that, and they. I just, I just had one guy cash out of six figures. And we again, we could talk about yeah. that another okay. day. But no, no, I mean, it. I think it's, I think it's, I think it could, it that could become an entire discussion, and we'll we'll be here all yeah. all day. But the key is, my goal is always to have the guy that's thirty five years old, in twenty years or less, know that he's going to retire on at least. Ten grand a month. If I screw up, if yeah. the market just tanks at least one time, yeah. he's going to retire on ten th ten thousand a month. Yeah, that's beautiful. Forty five year old. Well, now are we, are you are, are you primarily focusing on buy and hold? Are you advocating flipping at all? Are you dealing with that um, with with any clients, or are you really primarily going for cash flow buy and hold? If they come to me as flippers, and many of them do, yeah. I show them them how to synergistically because that gives them just a phenomenal advantage. Yeah, it's like it's like the rest of the people are coming to a gunfight with a knife compared to those guys. Mm -hmm. Because and in, in when I talk about the ten thousand a month in twenty years, there's two assumptions there: no appreciation ever, right, and never increase your net operating income yeah. for the life of the hold. Okay, um, again, old school. But what I tell the flippers is. Re reposition and re re channel your your after tax profits towards the paying down of loans. Or if you have if you're doing enough of them, if you're a if you're a pretty big time flipper, yeah. and you're doing maybe one a month, and after taxes you're making twenty five thirty a month per flip. Yeah, you're you're doing two or three hundred thousand. Well, you're just acquiring more property. Sure. So there's lines that cross. Does it make more sense for me to have the flippers just keep paying down loans right. or not pay down the loans early and save the money to buy more property? Yeah, yeah. And usually those, those decisions make themselves. Yeah. Those are rarely difficult decisions. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. Um, you know, and really quickly, we talk about the 40s, you know, guys in their 40s and well, guys and gals. You know, there are plenty of women investors out there. I have them. I know, I know. Um, so the, the guys and gals in their forties and their fifties as well. Um, what's, you know, how are we getting those guys to a comfortable retirement as quickly as possible? 
those are the people where, and we can talk about this later, I, I tell them, look, it, you're asking me to come in and, and play catch up. Yeah. And so you've got to act like you're 22 because your back's already, already to the wall. Yeah. And they already realize that if they don't change what they're doing now, yeah. they're going to be saying, hi, welcome to Walmart. Yeah. And I don't mean to be crude, but that's the bottom line. And they no, know. Sure. Sure, sure. And you're talking about people that have made a lot of money at their jobs sometimes. Yeah. So, so what we do is we get them to, to get as much capital up front as they can. And a lot of times, and we can talk about it later, that's cashing out some pretty heavy numbers. Yeah. IRAs and 401ks. And we get them to go full on into as much property as they can buy. And then we have them take the money that they were loading into those retirement plans. Yeah. And paying down those loans, which are now at, at lately 5%, a little bit over, yeah. 30 year fixed. That's no, free money, yeah. Yeah, and we're just, we're just crashing those things. So if somebody, well, I've had guys come to me, they're 53 years old. And I said, look it, what do you have? And the guy says, I can give you $500,000. Mm -hmm. This is a true story. Bottom line is, we got them, we spent four hundred and eighty-five grand. In about 60 days. Right. Some of it was free and clear. It was very strategically um, executed. And the bottom line is they own some things with debt. They own some a one and a half of them free and clear. Yeah. And, and in literally less than nine years, they will have 75000 a year, 40% of which will be uh, tax sheltered for the next almost 20 years. Sounds good. Sounds uh, sounds sounds all right. Sounds a little better than uh, social security checks that uh, won't be around when uh, when I'm that age. So, well, usually uh, when I talk about social security people, it's only to to loosen them up with an icebreaker. Uh, <laughs> cool, man. Well, listen. So, so you know, we've been at this a little bit, covered a lot a lot of territory. Um, I think it's it's probably a good point to to call it, and what we can. We can try and continue and, and do this again some other time. Um, before we go, definitely want to give you the quick, the quick plug. Jeff Brown is uh, at baldguy.com. can be found on biggerpockets.com at biggerpockets.com slash users slash baldguy. He writes for us every Tuesday, I believe. Right. Um, so definitely look for his column on the Bigger Pockets blog. Definitely check out his blog. There's just, I mean... You know, you want to have your mind blown away. Get, get on, get on our Tuesday or get on Jeff's blog. Um, and uh, I, I'm Twitter, Facebook. You're you're all over the place. Easy to find. Tell me, uh, is there is there anything that you wanna you wanna pitch? Anything you wanna you know tell people to check out above and beyond that stuff? You know, uh, ironically, the the post that's draft in draft and ready to go for tomorrow. Yes. Uh, so I don't have to send you an email. Uh, uh, pretty much covers what I think I would like to say here, which is, you know, it's the, it's the answers to the questions you never knew to ask that are going to be the things that sabotage your retirement. Mm. Interesting. You can never know what you don't know. You're, you're going Yoda on me, man. You're, you're, you're like circular questions. I don't even know if, if you, I'm, my head's going to explode. You know, it's, it's one of those things. My, my grandma used to laugh at me when I used to tell her how smart I thought grandpa was. And she, one day she said, you know, a lot of people think he walks on water, but what he's too proud to tell you is he knows where all the rocks are. Again, blown away. You know what? <laughs> Frankly, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm sure somebody does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm guilty sometimes of actually not knowing. <laughs> Listen, Jeff, it's, it's been fun. Um, Again, we'll try and definitely try and do this another time. I appreciate it, and thanks for coming on. My pleasure, man. Anytime. You I enjoy it. it. Biggerpockets.com